Good evening, Laurentians, friends of Lavdale and India's Sterling Defense Forces. This is OL Nation, Session 8. I'm Rohan Shetty, Vindya, 1986. On behalf of our team, I welcome you to this unique session of OL Nation, focused this evening on India's men and women in uniform serving their country with pride and with honor, and more specifically, those amongst our old Laurentian community in the forces. It will be our 72nd Republic Day on the 26th of this month, and we have put together a very special session for you and to tell you a little bit more about what we've planned for you this evening. Here is our very own Kalpana Kutaya from the OL Nation Working Group. She's based in Atlanta, Georgia, Pankaj 1980. Welcome. Kalpana, good evening. Thank you, Rohan. 2021, another new year dawns, and the OL Nation Working Group looks forward to bringing you more in our series of professional thought leadership conversations. Also stay tuned for Big Hill Broadcast, a supplementary series on short topical podcasts relevant to all aspects of our Laurentian families and community. For this session, we have two esteemed old Laurentians as our speakers. They both are currently with the Indian Armed Services with distinguished backgrounds and exemplary careers and contributions in service of the nation. Their contributions are far too long for me to list on this introduction, so I will just keep it brief. Admiral Pinamutal is currently Flag Officer Commanding Goa Naval Area and is responsible for the 25 naval units in Goa. In addition, he also happens to be the Flag Officer, Naval Aviation. In this capacity, he heads India's Naval Aviation, which comprises a whole range of flying assets, including 250 plus fighters, helicopters, and maritime recce aircrafts. Most of you know Rohan Shetty as being the host of Oil Nation. He also is moderator for this particular session and is an accomplished entrepreneur, strategic thinker, ship broker, and maritime professional. He is married into the defense family with a large circle of Fauji friends. He has a career history of working in international shipping and logistic matters and several allied defense forces globally. General Carlo is currently the chief instructor for the Army at the Defense Services Staff College in Wellington an institution very familiar to all of us Laurentians. He has a 35 year service record with the Indian Army and you will get on hearing all about his phenomenal contributions to the country in a short while when he's in conversation with Samanthi Senare. Samanthi, besides being an author and producer, was an Air Force daughter for 17 years of her life and has had the opportunity of working on supplements on the Indian Air Force in the Telegraph and Sunday Mail which brought her closer as an adult to the workings of the armed forces. With these brief introductions of our highly accomplished speakers, I leave you to be inspired with the conversations to follow with the Admiral and the General. Thank you, Kalpana. Thank you, Kalpana. Cut. Thank you, Kalpana, for that. And yes, you are right. We have two fine officers. Yes, and gentlemen too, with us this evening. Our two segment session today will touch upon various aspects of their lives, their careers, their thoughts, and of course, their stories linked in many ways to Lovedale and beyond that. We will also have a big picture view of our forces from their points of view. Nothing too much in detail, but just enough so that we have a great perspective. While planning this session, we chose to include our young Laurentian audience and hope that they can be inspired to consider the Fauji way of life. We will cover a whole range of topics from school life and transitions, what motivated our panelists to make their choices, their careers from a broad as well as narrow perspective, including management styles a big picture and big, big picture concepts on defense and related geopolitical issues. It has taken a bit of planning and effort to get both our panelists together this evening. In spite of their exceedingly busy schedules here in Vasco, Goa 
and Wellington Tachtanil. On behalf of the Old Laurentians Association and OL Nation working team, I would at the outset like to thank Admiral Phil Post, Pani Mutil, and General Anil Raj Singh Kalong for setting aside a considerable amount of time to prepare and come on camera for this session. Thank you, gentlemen. This time around, I will be in conversation with Rear Admiral Philippos Pinimutil, a naval aviator at his, at his offices here at the headquarters in Goa of the Goa Naval Area. His hands-on approach over his 35-year career to date has, has earned him the respect of his colleagues and his force. He literally lives life to the fullest and considering the hand that he was dealt with just after high school and out of the NDA, he is an ideal example of our never given spirit. Like General Kalo, he is a second generation Fauji and I with that and with that I welcome him to OL Nation. Welcome Admiral Philpo. Thanks so much uh, Rohan, it's, I'm really happy to be here. And I must tell you, I've been following all the episodes of OL Nation and uh, the great work which all of you have been doing over these last few months. And I'm really happy to be a part of this. Thanks. Thank you, sir, for the warm welcome here in Goa from you and your team. I've been badgering Lieutenant Shubham and Commander Ranjit for these appointments. This is, you have a fantastic office. Congratulations on that. And what a fine view of the harbor. And the shipping guy I can see there, and I know vessel loading her cargo. Lovely. Let's now go straight back into the past. I understand that you and several others from your batch went to Lena school early in the 70s, making friendships and bonds for life. And then you guys walked across Beligano Bridge to Lovely. How firm and how strong are these relationships from the age of seven? The bonds are the strongest possible bonds one can have. And uh, you rightly brought out, I, mean, I, I joined Lena school in class three and went on to uh, love it after that. We have about uh, 10 of us from Lena who joined the class of 82. So those, those bonds are as strong uh, even today. And we are, all of us are in touch. We are on a WhatsApp group and uh, we are in touch almost every day. Thank you for that. What was prep school like? Who was your matron and housemaster? I know from my personal experience that they did make a deep impact on us. Coming in to Love Day, I felt that having siblings in school was a great bonus. Some responsibility, of course, but most certainly better than being completely on your own as a family. What was your experience with having siblings around Love Day? Prep school, I mean, it, uh, I mean, it went past in a kind of a blur. It was good fun. I mean, Tiny little kids and the memories of like skating down the those slopes. And uh, just two weeks ago, I biked down those slopes on a Triumph bike. So it was a kind of deja vu situation. And I understand people don't skate down there anymore. So great memories. And we had this uh, matron who was like a mom to all of us, and this fantastic guy called BL, Mr. BL Singh, who was a housemaster, a mentor in those days. And uh, I was kind of pampered because I had my sister Sarah who was three years senior to me and my brother Simon who was five years older than me. So every weekend they would come and take me to the tuck shop. <laughs> so I was kind of a pampered brat and I continue to be one <laughs> even now. I guess you, you had the uh, tough part of the job being the eldest sibling. In my case, like I said, I was the youngest. So I, mean, I was looked after by my brother and sister. And uh, my brother passed out of school in his class 11, that was before the 10 plus 2. In 77, when I was in class 6 at that time, my sister was in class 9. So my career choices were pretty much decided by what my elder brother did. And uh, our dad was in the Air Force. And uh, so at a very early stage, uh, we, my brother had decided to join the services, and so did I. So after school, I mean, uh, for the record, he was in the top three in his class, from class four to eleven. So it was not that he was a tail ender with just one choice of joining the services or something. He joined St. Stephen's and chose to leave and join the academy. And uh, if I remember right, he was seventh in the All India Merit. So when he joined, it was like uh, I mean, I, I lived each day of his uh, life in the academy, which he shared with my sister and I with letters every couple of weeks and so I knew, knew exactly what kind of PT tests he did and uh, 
horse riding, swimming and all that. So it seemed like a real uh, fun time. So I was very sure I'm going to follow that path and uh, he joined as a naval cadet. You know, one of the most difficult things for me was to wake up at 6 a.m. in those frosty cold mornings. There was just one exception, however, and you probably might remember Suicide Squad when we were in class 4. That, so that was sound as 1978 for me and I was pleasantly surprised to note that we had holiday for Founders Prep, especially MT, military training. If I recall well, it, they were on Wednesdays and Saturdays. And for this, I was always on time. I want to ask you, sir, what effect did this routine and pretty intense activity have on you, including skinning ups and then running the 400 meter periphery of top flags with a, with a Lee Enfield 303 rifle above our shoulders? Those rifles were probably as large as we were. Did this type of activity in school, military training, in, influence your career choices or your career choice in this particular case? So my choice of uh, career was totally because of my father and brother. But did military training help me? Absolutely. And, and in some small way, I, I would think uh, Captain uh, Major Abdul Khadr, I think he affected all of us. In fact, I had uh, written a small tribute to him uh, when uh, his son had asked us to send out videos when he was making something in, uh, for his dad. And uh, I mentioned something there which I truly believe in. Uh, I think he taught us to stand tall, to walk tall, walk proud. And I, I said that like whether it was uh, you know leading a guard or I guess walking into a boardroom, the conference and the, the kind of uh, you know, chest out and shoulders squared kind of an approach which every Laurentian has is thanks to this military training and uh, the way we carried ourselves. I, I think uh, the military training had a large part uh, to do a part with, to play. To play with whatever profession one joined. And it, it brings in a bit of uh, discipline into uh, our uh, way of life, whatever be your career choice. So I, I, I totally feel that it's, it's a really important part of our growing up in Lovedale. Let's talk about memories. For me, school was a bunch of fun. I had a great time. Of course, we did have a few rough patches, I think, in class 7, 9, and yes, in class 10 too. What about you? How about you? Are there any events in your memories during your school days that you would consider challenging? And how were you able to address and manage this situation or those situations? at that particular moment in time and beyond as you grew out of your team. I Now, when, when I look back, there aren't too many bad memories because uh, like when you're on the wrong side of uh, 50, you know, old and not so wise in my case, uh, it's like when, when you look back, I, I always feel that there's something to learn from every experience and uh, I think the bad experience or uh, adversity which one may go through uh, teaches you more than good experiences. So in school, uh, if you talk about bad memories, I guess uh, early 80s and late 70s, I guess there was a lot of ragging, which I understand that's no longer there. And uh, physical ragging, I think is an absolute no-no. And it's a topic which is uh, normally uh, brushed under the carpet and it's, uh, it's kind of uh, spoken about in hushed tones. So in my case, uh, Specifically, uh, I guess I, one of the issues was I like I reached my height at, uh, in class nine, <laughs> stopped growing after that. So in class nine, I was this really big and kind of tough guy. I could do a lot of push-ups and uh, probably seen as this kind tough of uh, like rebellious a sort of yeah, chap, yeah. which I yeah. wasn't. Yeah. And uh, so that ended up uh, getting me thrashed on <laughs> quite a few occasions for uh, no. The fault of mine. Of all the so, so we would do skinny ups, for instance, and yeah. bench push ups. For, and you know, I, I wanted to be like Bruce Lee, so <laughs> I could do like hundred push ups. So when when they would do 20, 30, it was not a problem. So another thing which uh, bullying teaches us is to stand by each other as as a class or as a house. So there were what twenty five of us in Sumero House, and the thing is that you stand by each other and uh, the other thing which you learn in a boarding school which now in later life one wonders like the, the time I saw this movie Scent of a Woman uh, took me back to this instance of 
you know, there, there was a time when some nice guy busted my <laughs> left eardrum and I was admitted in the hospital for a couple oh boy. of <laughs> okay. for about a month actually and uh, I was totally into, I don't know what <laughs> the misguided youth was, I always thought I want, always had to be this really tough guy who never snitched, never yes. tackled, yes. Or, uh, yeah. never gave his seniors yeah. name or uh, you, you never told on anyone. You don't ditch. You don't ditch. Yeah, well, we, 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 our term, our, our term uh, is ditch. you don't ditch. We, yeah, we didn't call it ditch. ditch. Ditch was something to do with uh, uh, a girl. Oh, <laughs> really? <laughs> so here it was probably, uh, I mean, it was the thing to do if you're a tough guy. So I, I fancied myself <laughs> as a tough guy. I may not have been really tough. But um, so it was just a uh, kind of uh, Omerta mafia, uh, mafia OC kind of a code that you never, <laughs> you never, never gave up anyone's name. So I went through that uh, one month and then when the headmaster had come and asked me who had hit me and I, I insisted that uh, the lights had failed and I banged my head. Banged your head, hit a telegraph post. Some uh, telegraph phone or <laughs> telegraph road. Uh, so the thing is that uh, and it went along and, and I, the point is but there was no choice in it in my tiny 16 year old mind. I mean there's, there's no question of divulging a name. And uh, it's a similar thing. <laughs> This center woman, that famous speech yeah, in the, the end. speech I, when uh, like, in uh, court, I, right? At a right disciplinary of, hearing yeah, where Al Pacino so, gives so a speech then, to protect yeah, the body. Yeah, yes. Exactly. So yes. I, I watched that movie some 6,000 times and uh, there, I, I actually started questioning the uh, whether it's right not to give up someone's name and uh, probably if one had done so, probably that uh, nice young man would have probably <laughs> thrown up as a better human being. And uh, then back to my, rewind to my uh, point about learning something good from something bad which you experience. So what after these experiences of this eardrum breaking and uh, several other guys who hit me, so I mean for the record, I, I don't hold a grudge against uh, anyone. Yes. So yes. this eardrum no breaker God. can like uh, sleep easy. Yes. So uh, it's, I mean, all the, the guys, uh, many of them have forgotten their names, so even the eardrum buster and all that. It's, they can sleep easy and <laughs> go to go and hunt them down like the very, uh, you know, Shindler's this kind of uh, ah, thing, okay. uh, Simon Weiss and Dahl and all those books one read, uh, nothing of the sort. Yes. So I mean, it's just a, it's not even a painful memory, it's, it's, a, yes, memory. it's a memory. But uh, the good which came out of this adversity yeah. was, it, I, it built up a really strong sense of doing the right thing at all times and, and uh, yes. always standing up for what is right yes. and never letting any unfair thing happen and yes. uh, so much so that a stronger person hurting a weaker person or a, a person in a position of power uh, messing around with a junior guy and, and yeah. that has uh, been my kind of principle since the time I was 16 and like I think 57 now I, I have I mean, crossed my heart and uh, hope to die and I have never let any unfair thing or any sort of uh, coercion or something by a person in power and even in my you right, act, basically, uh, what you're saying is you've actively discouraged uh, misuse of power. Misuse of power, of power, absolutely. And, and in my personal sense, I've, I've always, if I've had a problem with someone, I, I always fight, so to speak, with someone at my level or someone senior. I mean, if it's just an argument or something, I, I never uh, pick on anyone junior to me in rank or in seniority or in anything. So I, mean, uh, I detest any sort of. Uh, unfair or uh, some sort of bullying attitude and uh, I, I thank Mr. Yadam Buster for Thank you. Wow. wow. Well, that indeed is a very, very positive way to look at it. And yes, I can agree without any doubt on batch loyalty. My batch, the batch 86, we are a very strong, cohesive batch. A few years ago, a senior of mine actually, I, I, I met him somewhere and um, he sort of apologized for the errors of childhood and I said, I don't even remember. I, I had never even taken that issue, issue to heart. And it was a surprise to him that I said I held no grudge whatsoever. Consid and, I, and I told him that I considered you one of the good tough guys. I'm not sure about your God godfather story though, but I would like to be a fly on the wall if you two guys ever meet. Let's now talk about your transition from school to the services. Do you feel that Laurentians with our regimental past are a natural fit for the services? I mean, what was your experience on this matter and how were your choices affected? 
So I would say that uh, any boy or girl from Lovedale uh, joining the service is kind of a natural uh, progression and you're totally suited for the services because yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you're used to this disciplined uh, lifestyle and you yeah. hold your own in any kind of circumstance and uh, it's it's a kind of adventurous lifetime uh, i mean a, a life adventurous life and it's, it's almost like spending your life in uh, duke of edinburgh camp it's permanent and, dukes uh, permanent dukes <laughs> as you're doing stuff that you really like to do and there's lots of fun stuff so i was commissioned in january 1986 uh, joined the nda in 82 three years at the academy one year as a cadet and a midshipman and then you get commissioned and uh, you decide which branch you want to join. So this is essentially the executive branch, the engineering and the electrical branch. The engineering is the engineers, electrical guys are the guys who maintain radars and the systems and st stuff. Executive branch has various sub-branches, like you, you have the submarines, you have the divers, the aviators, you have navigation, gunnery, anti-submarine warfare. So you pretty much try and uh, get the branch which you want. So the uh, submarines, aviation, and diving are volunteer branches. So there's an age limit for each of these. So, so if you want to become a pilot, you opt for it before 25 and uh, you go through a stringent kind of a pilot aptitude test and uh, medical uh, medical examination of I mean, every body part. And once you make the grade, you go for your flying training with the Air Force. So I, I chose that part and I got my wings in 1988. I joined the helicopter stream and uh, no looking back after that, I had a chance to fly in uh, Sri Lanka during uh, Operation yes. uh, Pawan, yep. as well as two years later at uh, Restoro, uh, the operation in Mogadishu, Somalia. Yes, yes. So I spent some time there as well, and uh, it's been a roller coaster, right? Roller coaster? Yeah, for sure. But then, you know, careers for folks who are passionate about their work tend to be roller coaster rides. Ask my better half. What were your initial years at sea like? And how long, for how long were you at sea on a continuous basis? Uh, I know you're a naval aviator, but from a, from a naval point of view, how long were you at sea? Like there's this lovely poster I'd seen many years ago, but you know, choose a job you love and you never have to work a day in your life. So for me, it's pretty much been that. And uh, more by default than by design. I mean, actually for the first 28 years of my life, I, I never did a staff job. I never did a death job. So I was either flying or serving on ships of being an ex executive officer of a ship of I got a chance to command three ships. What type of ships? I, I commanded uh, a missile corvette as a lieutenant commander in this NASA ship, which is a Russian ship, Kepan, which is a, again a bigger missile corvette as a commander. And before that I was executive officer of uh, INS Delhi, uh, one of the top destroyers. And as a captain I commanded uh, Brahmaputra, uh, which is a missile frigate. And uh, I've uh, flown off the aircraft carrier that's uh, Virat for about, I mean, been on the carrier for about eight years. I finally commanded my carrier bone squadron, that's 330, it's a seeking squadron. So it's been uh, lots of fun, and I, I mean, it may sound kind of uh, unbelievable, but I actually, those 28 years, it, it, it never really considered it work. I mean, like flying an aircraft or running a ship, and dealing with people. It's the fun stuff. The actual work starts when you like sit at a desk. 28 years of fun, and that's a lovely, lovely way to handle to handle things. And yes, your codes are very, very apt. You're now a flag officer. Would you mind please elaborating on your current position, its role and responsibilities, or perhaps just in a nutshell? Yeah. So as a flag officer, Goa area, I'm responsible for the 25 odd uh, units, naval units, which are here, which vary from. A naval air base, the, the biggest naval air base, uh, and a Sansa to an armament depot to a support base and various uh, other, you know, there's an underwater range and over 25 of these units, a material organization. And so all the naval units in Goa are uh, under my charge as the flag officer Goa area. Whoever tennis this job has to be a, a pilot or a navigator because he is dual hatted. The second job is of flag officer naval aviation. That is, he's in charge of uh, 253 uh, fighters, helicopters, and maritime reconnaissance planes, which the Navy has. So these 253 planes are looked after by two rear admirals. One guy sitting in Delhi was the assistant chief of naval staff, Air. That was my previous Your job. Your previous position. I, yes. I did that for three years, yes. and uh, now I've been 
flag of the naval aviation for three years. Three yes. Years. So uh, as flag of the naval aviation, I am the class authority for uh, naval aviation. I'm in charge of the all the technical aspects. So uh, as well as the flying aspects. So if there's any modification to be done on any aircraft or uh, whatever, it's my responsibility. So I have a staff of uh, technical guys as well as pilots and navigators so they, and uh, headed by two commodores. So there's a CSO tech and a CSO air with a whole lot of guys under them for each of the 15 types of aircraft which we have. And uh, there are nine air bases all over the country. They don't report to me but I'm responsible for the efficient uh, flying, the proper technical uh, processes uh, under them. So they are tasked by their response, their respective commanders in chief. But I'm responsible for the proficiency of the pilots, proficiency of the technical crew, the syllabi of various training establishments. And towards this, I get to inspect all these uh, bases, which are spread all the way from Bombay to the Adam Nicobar Islands, where there are three bases over there. So I get to go there, and it's a very hands on job. So you, you are like one to one with each of these uh, technical officers, observers, Thank and you for pilots. That. So for that job, looks like running an airline. That's amazing. I had no idea the naval aviation branch was this complicated and had such a range of assets. Um, Richard Branson time. I have a quest I have a question for you. Never given is the motto of our school and is the underlying theme of this program. How has this set of principles centered around our motto, never give in? How have these principles affected your life and how do you how you conduct yourself? I would think that never given is the best motto in the whole world and uh, it's something which comes to each Laurentian's mind when you're facing a tough situation and that's been the case with me uh, as well and I know when I exchange notes with my classmates in uh, various walks of life uh, I feel that this, this never said I attitude as well as the in the sense of doing the right thing, which is kind of ingrained in your DNA as a Laurentian. I love Dale, I will have to check with somehow. <laughs> the thing is that uh, I think that uh, from our housemasters and uh, like from the from day one, I mean, you kind of told uh, the, the, to do, I mean, I mean, behave in the correct way, never lie, and stand up for what is right. And I think that's what we bring to the table in whatever organization we. Uh, join or belong to and uh, sometimes it, it's it's a hard path to follow in the sense uh, you, you don't take any shortcuts you, uh, you don't uh, you you always choose the harder right with each one of us from Lovedale and I, I think that's what we uh, learned uh, you know totally cut away on the other side of Benigoda Bridge <laughs> and uh, I'm very proud to say that I, mean, I, I think each one of us I mean, there's this huge value which we bring to our organizations and uh, it kind of permeates uh, down and uh, it's very uh, satisfying when you hear about everything in the Navy. I, I know but many uh, officers who put their kids into Lovedale after seeing that. I mean, we have about 15 officers in the Navy. And you have 15 officers. OL officers in the Navy? Yeah. Right in my, my staff, I got one guy and uh, I've been really fortunate to serve with uh, three or four of these guys in, uh, from the batch of 90 and all were really uh, great guys and uh, I've seen that there are a whole lot of parents and uh, uh, naval officers who have put their kids uh, back in school not the OLs, what I'm saying is non-OLs putting their non kids, okay. kids in school after seeing uh, the, the way the OLs, you conduct yourself uh, under, other than me, I mean the OLs Way they conduct themselves <laughs> because with, uh, you you are known to be a bungee jumping, bike riding, rock uh, star uh, admiral. Uh, so, uh, are you setting the right example, or what are you? What image are you trying to portray to our, no, I, it's, to our uh, colleagues? No, I, I think it's all about it. I probably see myself as that. I suppose seeing myself, seeing me as something <laughs> different. But the basic thing is that I always. Uh, Believe in you know the carpet diem type of you know seizing the moment and making the most of every uh, second. And uh, what I kind of believe in is like if you want to do something, just go out and do it. You know, even if it's something as as crazy as doing a bungee jump at like 55 years, it was on my bucket list. Bucket list. And I had a chance to do it when I was in Goa or 
uh, starting to bike. I mean, uh, Goa is a great place to try all these things. I've started cycling and started biking, and, and uh, it's. Uh, I mean, one has 24 hours in the day, so it's all about making the most out of every uh, moment. And uh, I've uh, been able to pursue my passion. Yeah, passion. Uh, and you know, basically, I, I think it's all about zoning out and giving every task your uh, all. You know, it's like. I love that Mercedes uh, line about the best or nothing, you know, I believe they have it in the factory or something. So I, I really like that line and uh, the thing is that uh, I, I try to tell my juniors, you know, like I said, if there's a job given to you, don't do it half hour. You know, yeah. just go all out or don't yeah. do it at all. Oh, no, and, no, no. And, and, and like give everything your stamp of quality that if you have done something, it will be perfect. I, mean, I, I, I try to follow that to the extent possible and, and the thing is that what I feel is that if you compromise and accept mediocrity uh, then it leads it on to more uh, mediocrity so what i feel is i mean the thing is that you talked about my two responsibilities of foga and fona has been a huge learning experience so in a day uh, i mean you've been kind of unfortunately i've been chasing you yeah? to uh, yeah. see a part <laughs> of my no, I've life. Seen, i mean i mean that's this is this is i mean you know it's not a matter of priorities uh, that you got to do what you got to do, and yeah. it's part of your responsibility. So, so what happens is now there would be some things which uh, may be more important than other things. Like for example, it could be something about deployment aircraft or uh, you know some operational kind of hugely important thing. And the, the next guy to meet you may be discussing the uh, you know redoing a cafeteria for the sailors or something. So what what I have tried to do is that like if that guy is discussing something as Monday as a uh, remodeling of cafeteria or uh, you know some sort of recreation room for the sailor or for the officers i try to zone out into I mean, zone into that space for those 20 minutes and forget about everything else and give it my all you know to make sure that i add value to whatever is brought to so me these are more management lessons uh, that you are mm -hmm. sharing with uh, our community what would you say is your management style your mantra your management mantra tell us a bit about how you manage your team and your organization, especially in the forces, since you keep, you know, you get posted every three or four years or so, and your teams change. You're in the same post, but you're in a different location with a different team. How do you manage? Thanks. I am uh, acutely aware that there are, I mean, like 90% of the who is watching this are hugely more capable than I. I mean, guys from Harvard and all fancy places and uh, doing much better than I have could ever imagine I've reached, but all the same, for all its worth, I'd, I'd like to share whatever small lessons I've learned and uh, principles I've followed in uh, the jobs I've done. I always believe that you should al uh, always question the status quo. And uh, just be because something's been done a particular way for many years, doesn't mean it's the right way. So always look at uh, different ways of doing things more efficiently. The other thing I found is that the most important thing is uh, people. And uh, people matter most in, in whatever job you're doing. And uh, I, I feel if you look after people and genuinely care for people, the rest would suffer itself. Other th the other thing I always practice is look at each assignment one takes up as an end in itself and not a means to an end. It's it's not that you command a ship so that you become a captain or you do something. So if you look at it, uh, it as an end in itself, I think you, you give it your 100% of your uh, focus and I think uh, success uh, automatically uh, follows. It's derived, I follow from that. Follows from, so the, uh, this, and uh, the other thing is what I feel is you spend a long, lot of time in an organization, like I've been for like 35 years in the Navy. I feel that that should count to something. So when you spend many years in a particular organization, what I feel is you owe it to the organization to add value to everything which comes into your office. So that's why I flash back to what I was talking about, uh, the, I mean, you know, remodeling a cafeteria to launching a missile or whatever. So if it's very important or less important, the, the point is that less important thing is very important to someone else. And it affects the lives of people. So uh, I, I feel you should never, if it's important enough for that guy to come and meet you in your office at whatever kind of managerial or leadership position you are, you must uh, give it your attention. And uh, I try to uh, 
practice. I mean, I, I don't write. I, I do practice that. So even if it uh, makes, I mean, kind of uh, ensures that I stay in the office really late because I also believe that it's very important to be uh, hands-on on things. So like one of my commanding officers said, there's some Russian saying which, says, which goes like trust but verify. So if there's something you can report on something. There's nothing like being there first hand and uh, getting out getting what, a feel what, for what it. really uh, is the matter and getting a pulse of the situation. So uh, I've tried to practice all these things and they've kind of uh, worked. And uh, also the the most important thing is to uh, enjoy the journey and the success of the journey or the de destination. Yes. Otherwise, you you know you, you keep chasing something and then in the end, if you suddenly find that you're alone, your family is not with you, or your friends are not with you, it, it'll be a kind of a lonely kind of a state That's right. to, to be. That's right. So uh, we are talking about, you, you use the word success. So success is basically a relative term. Uh, and that's what I believe. In, in your, what, what in your opinion uh, is success or is a measure of success? And how in your own uh, yardstick or in your own uh, plan, how successful are you or have you been or have you met your own milestones? <laughs> a tough uh, question. So, I mean, if I can go kind of uh, personal this is my uh, elder brother uh, he joined the navy and he died in uh, 1985 in a plane crash in, uh, in may 1985 i was commissioned in january 1986 uh, dad was an air marshal at that time so he was this really fantastic guy like all dads are and uh, one of the super achievers and he uh, wanted the best for the, the two of us my brother and i so you keep talking about both of us being in the Navy and both of us rising to the rank of... And Absolutely. there at that point I realized that there was a huge uh, weight on my shoulders because I, uh, I was the only guy left and uh, the thing is, and I was acutely aware of the fact that I, I, I didn't have the uh, caliber which my brother had. I mean, he was like uh, the topper of his course and the top three of his class in Lovedale and uh, top three at, uh, in the Navy as well. So I was somewhere in the, I mean, I was not, not a tail end, I was maybe in the top 10 or so. And uh, so I, I knew it was, a, it's going to be a huge struggle to match up to what my uh, brother could have or would have uh, done in the Navy. But uh, that, that was a kind of a driving force for me. And uh, another jolt was when I lost my parents in 97. So there was uh, my sister Sarah and I, and uh, they lost her parents and her brother. So at, at that stage, I was just a, I was a left-wing commander. So no great milestone in my life or something. So they, they, that was uh, one of those uh, crossroads in your life when you can kind of decide to sit back and take it easy. And and it's uh, it would have been hugely acceptable when you, you know, this poor guy who destiny is <laughs> messed with his life really bad. So I could have kind of opted to stay on in coaching and as a proprietary, done a uh, easy kind of a job, probably after yeah, some school. We uh, started a shack on the beach and shack, No, no, if I continued in the Navy, had, too, you continue? uh, had I continued in the Navy, I would mean, ask for a kind of an easy okay. billet because look, I'm this traumatized guy and uh, and the Navy is, is extremely good HR wise, so they would have probably put me in some easy shore billet and I could have Kind of hung but, you, around, but you chose otherwise. Hung around for 10 years or 15 years and yeah. then probably left after 20 years. Yeah. But there, it, so that was the tough decision to, I mean, do I take this easy path or do, or do I give it my all? So I decided to be on the latter and I kind of went all out and uh, one year after my parents died, I uh, took over command of Nasha and then I went to the staff college in Bennington. And then there was no looking back. So whenever I felt kind of dejected or you know, that, uh, you face tough situations. So for me, it was like that NASA, can, you know, failure, <laughs> failure is not an option kind of a thing. And uh, of course, my sister and brother-in-law, they, uh, they were always there for me and uh, to motivate me and push me onward and kick my, sorry, but once in a while. So I, I went on and things were kind of went okay. And uh, one was this kind of driving passion to achieve what my brother would have achieved, what my father wanted us to achieve and uh, added to that the sheer passion and love I had for my uh, work and uh, that kind of paid off I guess and things kind of went off okay I mean the staff college did a couple of 
more ship commands than I did a course in the UK, the Royal College of Defence Studies. And uh, uh, I, I was not too much into, I'm mean, not one of those studious types, but the thing is that when you do these courses in the Navy, you pick up a whole lot of these degrees by, by default. So. I got a MSc Defense Studies. Um, I, I think, I think, you're, I think, you're, I think you're, pardon me, but I think you're underplaying your achievements. When it's nice to be modest, but nothing comes. No, these things don't come easy. It takes a lot of drive. That's and really time. good to hear. You're open to policy, and that you have a year for all, all sorts of, all sorts of input. Trust but verify. Yes, I remember that, and also your definition of success. But I then you know. You know, I suppose it's in your genes to be a super achiever with your father and your brother and the rest of your family, and you are. What is your take on the term OL spirit? Each one of us seems to have a differing position, a differing position on this subjective term. What is your take on the term OL spirit? So I think the old spirit is something which is really great and priceless. I mean, for everything else, there's MasterCard and kind of thing. So here, I mean, it's something which uh, transcends years when you passed out or your age, no bar kind of thing. So in, over the last three years, I've been able to meet and host over 70 OLs. 70 OL are in Yes, <laughs> including, uh, you know, like, let's talk about uh, Central Good and Income. Uh, My class. And uh, Manohar Nambiar, who's a, I think he's a judge in, uh, in, in, in the Kochan High Court and a whole lot of guys. And so, so many juniors who I, I actually never knew before, and, and the fact that they pick up a phone and uh, give me a call, and were kind enough to drop in, and uh, it's been really great. And I, I would hope that uh, many of you uh, who else do make a trip to Goa, I hope to be here for another year or so. So I, I hope to see lots more of you. So that's, there are lots that's, of fun stuff to do in uh, Goa. There's a lot of fun stuff to do in Goa. Yeah, well, Goa is the party capital of India, and. Uh, so are you saying that you've been here now for four or three and a half four years? Uh, has it been a one continuous party? No, I like. Uh, I mean, you you've been uh, witness of the fact that <laughs> for the four years, you've, four days you've been here, I've never gone home before eight o'clock. So it's it's a. I, I mean, the weekends are. I mean, even the weekends are kind of full. But but like I said, that if you're passionate about what you do, I mean, it's it's fun. I mean, and I always take time out to follow my passions. I I, I love to swim, for instance. I, I love to dive. And, bike and so I literally do all these things when I travel as well. Yeah. So I choose a hotel which has the best pool and <laughs> I make sure that I get, get in my bit of swimming and uh, find time to do stuff which I love to do. Well, work-life balance is a key mantra these days and I'm really glad to know once more that you ardently follow your passion. My question now is about the services and related branches as a career choice for young folks, for young adults. We do have similar questions for General Kala. And we want, but we want two different perspectives, one from the naval point of view, and of course the army one. You being a flyer and also from an IAF family, will surely have a lot to say on this topic. Please. Yeah, great. Thanks for the question. And now, you know, the services. I mean, it's uh, we have a mix of sixty percent of permanent commission officers and forty percent of short service commission officers. So the short service commission is, is a fantastic option for someone who's not too sure of uh, what he wants in life. And uh, the point is like, the permanent commission is like you join and they throw away the key and so you've got to be there for 20 years. Short service is a really good option because you spend some great times in the Navy for 10 years and that springboards you into a fantastic career in the corporate world. So there are a lot of my youngsters who've left and done a one year course at the ISP or XLRA and, uh, and then uh, taking up some great careers because the, the corporate world would love the fact that this guy is just 35 years old, he has a terrific work ethic, he's disciplined, he or she. There are a lot of exciting branches one could join. So you could be a, like, like you mentioned yourself, you could be a, a pilot for women and men, you could be a navigator again for women and men, then there's uh, IT professionals, there, there's a JAG branch which is a law and there's logistics, there's uh, engineering, electrical, and uh, various branches. So you can choose a branch that you want to join, and uh, I, I think it's a, it's a great career option. And uh, when I look back, actually, the best time of the uh, services is the first 10 or 12 years. So, so you, you know, stick out with the best, and then, then move on 
if you don't like it and, and also there is there's, there is an option to in some of the branches there is an option to convert it into a permanent so, permanent so, so after 10 years if you really like it you can stay on otherwise you you can leave and so basically uh, the best of both worlds absolutely most mm -hmm. most most interesting i believe things have really changed since since we were kids and i'm really glad to know that there are a whole range of options available out there in this modern age taking a cue from an earlier question um talk about how normal is your family life it's a bit subjective obviously and you have had first hand uh, first hand experience as a defense defense kid too don't the children have a fantastic time? Uh, no, I, my daughter is 24, so I mean, most of the time she's like taking charge of me and uh, she keeps wondering whether I actually do any work. <laughs> the only side of me she sees is riding a bike or cycling, doing some funny stunt like bungee jumping. So she, many times she comes to ask me, do you actually work? I, I do <laughs> sometimes. So uh, the thing is that her, she's been, uh, most of the time it's, it's my wife Priya who's been kind of left to fend for the house and uh, look after her studies and, and stuff and I guess we've done kind of okay. She's a sub-editor with uh, Indian Express. She graduated from Lady Sri Ram College and, and she's got some 70 articles out on Indian Express online. So I guess we've done kind of okay. So uh, the thing is that they, for the family, you live in a adornment, you live in a kind of a protected environment, you don't lock your house and you, your kid can run around anywhere, you get the best of facilities, you are members of the, I mean you get membership of the best clubs, whether it's Delhi Gymkhana, Wellington Gymkhana, and you have facilities like, uh, you know, squash, tennis, swimming pool and every base, so I mean there's, there's uh, I guess something special about being a, a defense kid, I mean you shift, uh, how, I mean, you shift your now, you get posted every two years, so you build up a different set of friends and uh, you're quick to adapt to, to new circumstances, new situations. So I think that's a huge strength which uh, defense kids uh, bring to whatever organization they join. So I think uh, all in all it's been good and unlike the uh, army, I mean, there, there, there are no real separations, there are no field area postings, so, so you're pretty much with your family, it's just that when you're on a ship, an operational ship would sail something like 200 days in a, in a year. So you're away from your family for those 200 days. But otherwise, at, at the senior level, you're, it's just that you get home a little late. And, and yeah, more, 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 but I, I guess like it's, it's as yeah, it's as as bad yeah. in the corporate world as well. I mean, you, and uh, this getting home late and all is actually kind of uh, based on the, the way you work. I mean, it's kind of what some people we may say it's inefficient. <laughs> I tend to stay here late because I, I spend a lot of time going to these units which are under me and uh, can, uh, having a hands-on sort of feel of what's happening and I spend a lot of time with uh, anyone who come, wants to come here and meet me so I, I don't have that system of green light and red light and the door is open and anyone can walk in. So that uh, the penalty which I pay for that is like I start my file work and all that after everyone goes home. I don't hold back anyone. So and everyone goes home at 5.30, that's when I start my, the boring stuff, the five and stuff. Meeting people is always good. So it's a kind of a choice and here I'm pretty close to my house. The other day you came by with, with a bicycle and a crisp white seat cover. Is this your new trusty seat? It was a bit of an eye opener for our kids who are used to seeing your peers um, with cars, with stars and flags fluttering. Is this part of your leadership style? Tell us more about your trust. Well, firstly, my, my house is really pretty close to my office over here. And what had happened is after uh, the COVID kicked in, we have something like 35 cars which are hired for all my uh, the, the senior officers. So when, uh, when the COVID started, I dehired these 35 uh, cars. And uh, to leave by example, I made sure that mine is not a hired car. It's, it's a Navy uh, car with a flag and all that. So I stopped using my car after that day. So for the last like whole year, I have not used my car. I use my cycle that's within this base where my office is. So I call for my car only if I'm actually leaving the base and going to the air base or going to, this, to meet some government official or going to CM's office or something which I do once in a week. So those times when it's outside this perimeter of this place where my office is, I, I ask for a car otherwise I'm 
cycling. And because the other officers had to use their personal cars to commute from their homes. So on the, on the same lines, uh, like I told you, I, I inspect something like nine of the air bases of the Navy. So now I'm on my third round of these inspections. So when I, when I inspected the very first base, I found that uh, my, I've got a kind of a top heavy team. So there's a lot of kind of senior officers. So I found that uh, like what I, another principle which I've followed in every assignment which I've taken over, I, I always believe in not changing anything for about two months, you know, seeing what's happening. Because one is that if something's been happening, there must be some reason with the, per, with the previous guy. So if you change, so after two months, I'll be really sure of wanting to change something. Because if you change it right away, it's, it's like pointing, like saying that change the previous guy is going to change or, or trying to make a statement that the previous guy is an idiot or something. So I, I would never do that. So after two months, um, I, I tend to bring about changes which kind of align to my style of leadership or what I feel is right. So in the very first inspection which I had uh, taken, I found that there was this huge convoy of some 10 cars. So you would go from a block to a block, uh, to different units and there would be these guys sprinting from the 10th car and catching up with me. So from the day two itself, I converted it into a bus in the sense so all of us including me sat in a bus, a mini bus and we went from place to place. So ever since for the last three years, all inspections have been in a bus. So I, I, I don't take a car. So I thought that was, that's uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's good on many it's more like operational efficiency. Yeah, efficiency, and the other thing is that it, I think it uh, puts forward a, a message to the field units. I mean, the point is, so they see us as guys without any frills. Firstly, all inspections are in flying overalls. So that's what you fly in. So the moment you're in a white uniform, it's like this. Uh, you're not really doing a man's job. You're not actually flying. So I'm getting a point to fly wherever I go, and I, I, I'm still in active flying. I, I fly my helicopter. I do at least four sorties every month, including landing on ships and all that. So I feel leading by example makes a lot of difference. You can fly as well as a guy who's doing that every day. So firstly, all of us are in overalls. We go in a, in a bus. We cut out all frills. Totally focused on the job we are set out to do. And I, I think that uh, sets a good example down the line and uh, hopefully would um, uh, spur the junior guys to also follow suit when they reach uh, senior level, say a Commodore 1 star or 2 star level, they realize that this paraphernalia doesn't really matter and uh, what you are is what, I mean, what you have within and uh, what you wear on your shoulders, I mean, uh, and, and uh, in a, on a philosophical note, your rank or your, the medals which you have, finally end up as a prefix or a suffix to your name when you retire and then it doesn't matter at all I mean, if deep yeah, down if you're not your character, good, your attitude and attitude which, which, which lives, lives on much after you yeah. share your uniform and all so always believe in that so I try my best to do the right thing looking back is there anything that you would have done differently over this 35 year career I'm, I'm talking about the beginning of the career is there anything you would have done differently or do you look back and regret something in the past? <laughs> Talking you arrogant and nothing. Actually everything has been exactly how I wanted it to be and uh, I've pretty much been able to do or achieve everything I had set out to do and uh, it's, it's been a fantastic journey so I mean uh, I followed the principles which I uh, enumerated at the beginning and pretty much achieved all the milestones that any new officer would, uh, would hope for and so I, I'm pretty satisfied with the way my life has turned out and, I, and most importantly I've enjoyed the journey, it's, it's been a great journey, I, I wouldn't want to change anything. Over the years you have inspired many many Laurentians, young and old, with your stories and successes. Do you have, would you have any messages, any message to pass on to our audience Young Laurentians and old Laurentians. Uh, I, you've been very kind. I don't know about the inspiring part. I, I think I'm an extremely average guy who's very passionate about what I do. I've tried to do the right thing at all times, and things have kind of worked out. And uh, I would uh, encourage more Laurentians to join the services and uh, for a great life, which the services has to offer. And uh, otherwise, also, I mean, I, I, I would just say that. Uh, Follow your passion, find your niche in uh, whatever space you're interested in and uh, don't just conform 
to what even your parents would I mean, mean the best for you but uh, I would say follow your dreams and uh, go um, all out uh, to, to achieve what you, what you have in mind and, uh, and I'm highly inspired by say Steve Jobs and I, I believe he was a terrible boss or whatever but what I feel is that someone like him I mean the, the sheer passion that uh, in the last days of his life also he he went to work and uh, what struck me at that time, I, I keep following him, I used to follow whatever he all his quotes and his writings and then it suddenly struck me that <laughs> you can't win against Steve Jobs. If, if you have a guy who's uh, I mean, so passionate that he's obviously not doing it for money, but he, he knows he's going to die in a few months and he's still uh, going to work, you can't compete with someone like this. He will always win. So uh, I, I feel that that's the kind of passion uh, each of us needs to uh, bring to our uh, jobs and uh, so all the best to all of you and uh, what, what I feel to all of us and um, all laws senior to me and junior to me what I feel is we should, we should keep our uh, lines uh, open to any Laurentian who were to uh, make a call and uh, if we can help them in any way in career choices or any sort of help and you're abroad and some kids come in there and just I, I would say that the if an oil calls you the answer has to be yes you have to reach out and help and I, I think uh, and do what you can yeah absolutely and uh, I think that'll make a lot lot of difference and, uh, I mean their faith in the system and the uh, oil uh, community would be strengthened that much more. Ah, yes you can't win against Steve Jobs <laughs> thank thank you so much for that message and yes yes I agree I agree with you this program is centered around some of those principles to strengthen also as you know and I'm really glad you know we're moving forward and have achieved some of our objectives how about all Laurentians I refer to several old Laurentians in the services at the beginning of the program are you in touch with all Laurentians serving all Laurentians and how do you interact with them to, and to what effect has there been any positive uh, benefit with, uh, as a result I'm of I'm very happy to say <laughs> I know the exact number and I have a, actually have an excel sheet with each well, Fauji, that's what the, the, I call the group, the OL Fauji group, which I started more than two years ago. And uh, what uh, caused me to start this group was I, I realized that our numbers are so few. So, uh, like when I was growing up in the Navy, I, I knew there were a couple of uh, senior, uh, highly distinguished OLs like uh, Admiral Anil Chopra, who was my commanding officer on Virat when I was commanding the squadron. He was a huge inspiration, as well as uh, Admiral Raina, Vice Admiral Raina, who was uh, uh, heading the logistics branch of the Navy, so I, I served under him when he was in the Western Naval Command. So there were uh, very few seniors and uh, in, the, in later uh, years, I think more OLs joined the service, but still our number is not uh, very much, it's still about 50. And I, I have the list with the names and locations, and undisclosed locations. <laughs> So uh, we have just, uh, strangely, we have just one Air Force officer, uh, Air Commander George, uh, George Thomas. George yeah. Thomas. Yeah, you know, he's our batch. Your batch. George Thomas, uh, sorry, he's a great friend of mine, uh, ultimate test pilot. He's been uh, DA Israel. You know, so yeah. he's the only Air Force guy, but he's so good. <laughs> he's a, he one, very, he's also very, very passionate. He's a very passionate He's an uh, amazing guy. Yeah. He commanded the Sukhoi 30 squad. Yeah. And really fine guy. Yeah. And we have quite a few naval guys. And like I said, I was really fortunate to serve with uh, at least six of them, <laughs> including one, two of them who are here with me uh, in the Goa Naval area and a whole lot of army officers. So the numbers have been swelling over the years and now I think I've kind of got every guy <laughs> on the group. So it's across batches. I think the junior most guy is some 2000, 2008 or something and there are a whole lot of other guys who... 2011. 2011, I'm sorry. So uh, they, you know, added their classmates, juniors and all that. So we have kind of uh, have a kind of complete group. In Naval Aviation, we have a guy called Mario Chandi. And uh, likewise, uh, Army stop having got two, uh, one Lieutenant General, a whole lot of Major Generals. Vikram Singh, my classmate, was the Vice Head Boy and a hugely distinguished guy in the, you know, from a like fifth generation uh, martial uh, family and the other thing about oil forces is that we've got guys from rank second lieutenant all the way to lieutenant general so if a guy were to want advice on anything so 
let's say if guy wants to know which aircraft he should fly or some guy wants advice on when one should write the staff college exam or what kind of career path he should choose. So now he's got a, a whole bunch of people to advise him on this group on a, on the forum or on a one-to-one -one basis. So it's, it's been a very successful group. So I hope to continue it and I, I'm, I'm sure more and more guys will join the group as they it's as of now serving uh, officers. That's really great to hear that you have established this WhatsApp, uh, another WhatsApp group and are maintaining these connections and I'm really glad to hear that. I'm not sure you're aware but <laughs> I've taken the li liberty to get in touch with an old orange in, in this very building and he has a few words to say about you as his boss. I'm pleased to introduce to you Captain Pratik Ghosh from the batch of 1990, my sister's batch. Pratik, yes, he's also a second generation Fauji and just happens to be reporting to Admiral Philippos upstairs. He's currently in charge of logistics and personnel. Captain, I briefed you on our OL Nation project and of course my interview today. Now here I would like your opinion of Admiral Philippos as an officer, as a boss, an old Laurentian and of course a human being. Please. Admiral Philippos to me, uh... I look at him in, in two senses. One immediate immediate boss is my is my immediate superior. I re report to him, so there's that professional aspect to it. And then he's also an old Laurentian, purely coincidental. In the in armed forces, we don't decide where we go on transfer. It is decided at a very different level, very high up level, and uh, based on career profiles of people, we are posted to various assignments or billets, as we call it. So as a professional. And as he being my immediate uh, superior, who I report to, it is excellent working with him, a person that he is professionally, that's one. And secondly, in his own human resource managerial skills. The gentleman gives me absolute latitude to do my job and does not uh, micromanage the way I do things. That, 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 that speaks volumes about him because that allows me to use my initiative and I don't lose my initiative whilst I'm tenanting my uh, discharging various duties. He sets my goals. He's, I set my goals, but he sets my tasks. He sets my, sets, sets my tasks and leaves it to me to do it to the best of my ability and gives me course corrections as and when required, if required. So that, that's, that's, that's a huge uh, plus for a, for a subordinate from a superior when a person lets the, super, the the junior officer to be able to use his initiative make mistakes because if you work you will make mistakes and that also speaks volumes about admiral Philippos that he has the confidence in himself to be able to correct my mistakes as and when i make it and without without getting flustered about uh, you know the, the no sin, no uh, snafu syndrome kind of thing so that's that's him professionally I'm his chief staff officer. Uh, my job is to advise him. End of the day, decision lies with him, and he has the broad shoulders to also, uh, you know, uh, carry any kind of snafus that we create under his command. Now, but there, there is another aspect to him which is now it's it's not it's implicit that he is also an old Laurentian. And I said it's purely coincidental that I'm appointed over here, and so is he. Uh, the onus lies with the subordinate officer. When we are from the same school, we have a history, we have a background, uh, we share common uh, education, common values, common uh, you know uh, previous uh, history, etc. The onus lies with the subordinate officer to maintain that thin red line, because that is something in any organization it doesn't have to be just in the uniform services where we are very cut and dry about seniority, etc. Uh, we, it's the onus on this junior officer to maintain that line, especially in public forums where you don't get too familiar and, uh, and, and, and neither does he. But when we are in, in a one-on-one -on -one situation in, in his chambers or in a private moment somewhere in, in any other social environment, we have our little moments where we you know, catch up on little old Laurentian anecdotes or like uh, uh, Mr. Shetty is in town. He was the first person to inform me that Mr. Shetty is in town. We share those informations like I have a Laurentian classmate, a batchmate coming into town. I would obviously inform him. But those are private things. But when it comes to professional, they have to maintain the professional decorum. But yes, there are there, there are some amount of lowing down the guard when we are in a private, uh, in a pr private situation, personal situation. 
and and there is a little more free and frank exchange of opinions when your superior officer with a superior officer especially when he is from your school and uh, when we share the same common background thank you so much sir i will wait for his reaction to this uh, message of you thank you very much so what did you think? I noticed that uh, just behind me, you have all, I mean behind you, sorry, you have all these medals, these little badges on your desk and in this, uh, in, on that little stand out there, is a I can see a lovely impact amongst all these military medals. It's really nice to see that. On a most on a, on a most, on a most serious note, I'm really glad to see you behind your desk. And my question to you from my colleagues on the working group is, have you, ever found yourself in a position of danger at any time in your professional career, life-threatening, one that you probably can talk about? Please share. I, I would love to say yes, that I uh, you know, single-handedly fought some hordes of pirates and all that. I mean, there were a couple of uh, pirate attempted pirate attacks when I, I done these convoy operations when I was in command of Brahmaputra, where we have an Indian naval ship deployed in the Gulf of Aden, carrying out uh, anti-piracy operations ever since uh, like started in 2008 till uh, today. So I did a three-month deployment there and uh, thwarted a couple of pirate attacks. And, uh, and strangely, one of the convoy operations which we were doing, uh, the, I came across one of the captains was an old Laurentian, uh, Andrew Basin. So he's settled in Kunor and in fact he's, he spoke the other day. So it was a happy coincidence. So that was one and uh, Somalia as well as uh, Somalia. So are you saying Andrew there. Basin put you in danger? Uh, I didn't get that. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was part, he was a cap. We were, I mean, in, during those three months there, I mean, there were countless uh, merchant ships we escorted. And uh, so one fine day when I was sitting on the bridge and I got this call from a guy who wanted to speak to Arjun Dev Nair. So I said, why would you want to speak to any? I mean, there's this, on ships, there's this way of, you know, you call up the guy in channel 16, and you switch to another channel and have a private conversation. So sure enough, this guy said, you know, channel 78 or something. So I went to the channel and he said, uh, any idea where Arjun Dev Nair is? I said, hey, he's a great friend, but why do you want to speak to him? He said, I'm from his school. I said, I am from the same school. So then he said he was Andrew Christine. So I remembered him because he was in school when we guys passed out. Uh, graduated, we didn't pass out. <laughs> so uh, that was fun. I mean, uh, like uh, escorting another OL through pirate infested waters. So there were a couple of uh, pirate, uh, I mean, I attempts, incidents, piracy, piracy incidents, incidents which we thwarted, but I mean, nothing exciting. You no, know, what is that Captain Philip kind of thing? And uh, it didn't happen. And even in uh, Somalia and Sri Lanka, I mean, but there were a lot of flying, but there was no. Firing. I was not fired at directly, so I can't really boast of any, uh, you know, hands-on combat kind of thing. So, I mean, on a lighter way, uh, 93 was when this uh, Somalia stint happened. And uh, we had gone there just after the, the famous Black Hawk Down movie uh, about the, when the American was killed in Somalia and uh, there was this famous movie. So I got married in 93 and I wanted to impress my brand new wife so we, we, we were watching this movie and you know it starts off with this helicopter flying through this very desolate terrain and i said oh i've been here and i recognize this place and she looked at me with immense respect and at the end, end of the movie they said filmed in morocco so <laughs> that was really sad didn't go down there, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 I, that's <laughs> well it's nice it's good to, it's good to hear uh, about that Black Hawk, Black Hawk Down story and the and that, well, pirates as well. I wish I had known you at that at that particular time because I think it was June 2008. We had one of our vessels, the Amir Scan, that was hijacked off the coast of Somalia. Unfortunately, unlike Andrew, I had no one to call. And then, you know what? Mm, these things it cost us a pretty, pretty, pretty penny to get the ship released. It was a it was a, it was a challenge for us. Had you been there? Maybe we would have we could have filmed it and shown the director's cut to Priya and the rest of the family, and that would have been genuine. Thank you very much. Go. Talking now about family, Admiral, you have had extreme stress and a lot of tragedies uh, earlier on in your life. 
with the passing of your brother Simon, your folks a few years later, a complex hand that was dealt to you. How were you able to cope, especially in situation like you were having just joined the forces? Like I mentioned, the Navy really uh, looks after its own and uh, after facing a uh, personal tragedy of the sort I had, I mean, they would have surely ensured uh, that uh, if, if I wanted to say remain in coaching or take on lighter assignments and not sail, they would have surely helped me with that, as I mentioned. So from the service, I had huge support and uh, even more importantly, I had the support of my uh, family, my uh, sister Sarah and uh, brother-in-law who was a brigadier. So he was there to advise me, my sister was there, as well as my amazing family, my wife Priya, who is herself a army kid. And so she understands everything about the services and my daughter Rahel. So they were always by my side and uh, Rahel was uh, growing up and uh, Priya kind of looked after the home front where I could concentrate on my work. And they were always there when I fell down and uh, that's how I guess I was able to cope. So yeah, we are in a different setting and you touched upon the topic earlier, but will you be a little bit more specific on your responsibilities and of naval aviation as a whole? I had commented that you could be responsible for running an airline like Richard Branson uh, or, or the equivalent. Are there any specific, any specifics? Can you elaborate uh, specifically on the types of aviation assets that are under your oversight? Okay, uh, naval aviation forms an uh, extremely important component of the Navy. The Navy operates in three dimensions, that's uh, surface, underwater and the air. So we have a force of like 253 aircraft, which comprises fighters, helicopters and maritime reconnaissance aircraft. And uh, these are uh, looked after by two uh, rear admirals. That's a guy in Delhi called the Assistant Chief of Naval Staff Air, which was my previous job, which I did for three years, and the Flag Officer Naval Aviation, which is my current job. The ACNS Air looks after policy, HR, acquisitions, and uh, dealing with the government. Thanks, what then is the role of such a large fleet? Why do we need such a large fleet? I mean, is it large? What is, the, what, what is the role that naval aviation plays? plays sorry. Um, and what about humanitarian um, assistance? I mean, you know, we've seen it in the press and uh, the, the Navy and the Defense Forces PR section puts out these videos. Um, what have you done? What has the Indian Navy and more specifically the Naval Aviation Arm done? So Naval Aviation has contributed uh, immensely in uh, all dimensions. In the peacetime, we are continuously build, uh, building up something called maritime domain awareness. So we are responsible for the, I mean, the Indian Navy's the area of operation stretches from uh, Gulf of Hormuz to, all the way to the Malacca Straits and way down south as well. So at, on every day we have our aircraft and patrol and you're picking up uh, the, the various multinational forces as well as various transmissions which would stand us in good stead if the balloon goes up and so we generally know which all ships are present in this area and in addition there are a lot of other operations like the anti-piracy patrols which are happening in the gulf of Aden, which has been happening since 2008 we have one ship on station and these all ships the larger ships from frigates size and above uh, have an integral helicopter which plays a very important role and I mentioned the MH60R. The MH60R is the ASW, uh, the air anti-submarine warfare element of a ship. And the in a submarine probability area, you have this helicopter going ahead and kind of sanitizing the area so that the ship is safe because the helicopter is impervious to attack by a submarine because it's equipped with a tipping sonar. You know, you, it hovers and lowers this sonar which sends out sound waves and picks up submarines. So that goes ahead of the ship. And it's also equipped with two uh, torpedoes, so it could, it's literally, I mean, many times it's called a flying frigate. It has all the sensors which a ship has, and it's got a self-attack uh, capability. So it brings a lot to bear uh, on the 
uh, you know, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. So one would remember the tsunami or, or uh, more recently the MS370, which was missing in the Indian Ocean region. And the, the first aircraft on task was our P8, the Boeing P8I, which we got from the US. So that was the first aircraft on task. And so there's a huge amount of humanitarian assistance which happens with the floods, which are almost, it happens every year. And uh, like the last couple of years, we've had floods in Kerala, Karnataka, and Maharashtra. So there have been various operations as well as search and rescue operations on the high seas where uh, numerous people have been rescued. During the COVID crisis, I mean, we've had uh, various operations like Samudra Operation Samudra, Samudra Setu, where literally thousands of our countrymen were evacuated from the Middle East and various destinations. We had uh, utilized our landing ships and landing platform dock, uh, which have huge capacity to carry relief material as well as our countrymen bring them back. Okay, a slightly larger picture now. What about our naval, Indian Navy as a force itself? What is the reputation of our Indian Navy in an international context with other nations and their seaborne, friendly nations of course, and their seaborne forces? How are our forces deployed with them and to what effect? Uh, our uh, Navy is highly respected uh, among the biggest navies of the world. And uh, from as early as 93, we've had these annual, uh, annual uh, exercises with the US Navy. There's the Malabar series of exercises, which has grown in uh, complexity and the numbers of ships over the years. We have exercised Baruna with the French Navy and uh, Konkan with the British Navy every year. And uh, the current year, it was uh, the Malabar was expanded to the level where we had uh, Japan and Australia would be part of this exercises. It, uh, and it, the, the US had an aircraft carrier. There are times when a nuclear submarine has also come in here. So the complexity has constantly been increased. And uh, in the region, we are looked upon as the preferred security provider by the, uh, the local countries and the, the littorals in the Indian Ocean region. And in uh, peacetime, you asked about, I, I talked to you about Samudra Setu and uh, various other HADR, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief uh, operations. And in less than war situations, equivalent to the LECO or the low intensity conflict operation, which our friends in the army, undertake. We have a lot of exercises for uh, to ensure our coasts are, uh, are clear and uh, close to the coast you have the Coast Guard which is uh, they are responsible for up to 12, 12 miles you have the Coastal Police and Customs and uh, the smaller vessels the Coast Guard and beyond that to the exclusive economic zone which is 200 miles you have the larger Coast Guard vessels patrolling. Beyond that and uh, in various deployments, you have in the naval ships. You, we have ships on northern, central, and southern deployment, as well as we have an anti piracy patrol, like I mentioned, and a Malacca Straits patrol. And uh, we normally operate independently. So these ships are there. And uh, the advantage of these patrols is you're able to immediately respond to a situation which might arise. So, of course, in peacetime, it's generally been pretty benign operations, like uh, re reacting to a cyclone in a country or uh, there was a water crisis recently and uh, we were able to help the country concerned. My question now is, what signal does the Indian Navy send to other hostile forces, to hostile forces? We've got a couple of challenges, I mean, pretty, I mean more than a couple of challenges, like, like any sovereign nation would have. What signal do we send to the hostile, to those who are hostile to our country? The uh, ultimate aim is to deter War to avoid. I mean, the, you you have a strong navy to deter anyone uh, anyone's inimical uh, intent. So with that, like we we were like, uh, what better example than a carrier battle group with, with an aircraft carrier carrying some twenty fighter aircraft and escorted by the top of the line destroyers and uh, missile frigates. So that's that's a huge. Uh, instrument of state policy and which you can which moves at some uh, phenomenal rate of 
couple of hundred miles a day. So you can actually position these carrier battle groups where you, uh, as of now, we have only one carrier. Which we have the indigenous aircraft carrier, which is uh, being commissioned shortly. Are perceived, is India or is our Navy perceived as a threat by neutral and non-hostile nations? What do, they, what, what do they look at us as? What is their uh, opinion of our country? No, no, not at all. And uh, we are seen as a really responsible nation who can be counted upon. That's why I use the term the preferred security provider as we are looked upon like the big brother in this region as a responsible power with uh, huge capability and a highly professional navy in all three dimensions. I mean, we're adding the, the nuclear submarines which have uh, joined our arsenal in the last couple of decades, more than a couple of decades here. Uh, so the, uh, I would say three decades. It is a phenomenal capability which we, which we have. And uh, another important aspect is keeping a slow so sea lanes safe for navigation and ensuring our uh, energy lines are uh, secured. And uh, with, with the phenomenal growth our country has seen, uh, we are thirsty for oil and energy resources, which uh, we are able to ensure. Well, now we have we had a long session. Thank you so much um, for you know staying with me. Uh, I'm towards the end of my questions now. Um, my last question probably would be, what is the state of modern India's navy today, our fleet, and across all these dimensions you spoke about? Are we not construction constructing um, our own ships? It's all over the press right now, including uh, you know. The international press, they, they talk about India doing this and India doing that and make in an India and uh, concepts like that. Please elaborate on that. We have a sizable number of ships uh, which vary from tiny missile uh, corvettes to even smaller fast attack craft all the way up to the aircraft carrier. And uh, it's a matter of pride that uh, over 40 ships which are in construction are uh, in construction in our uh, indigenous shipyards. And all the ships which are commissioned are uh, more or less 60 to 70% indigenous with some weapon systems and sensors imported. So the Atman Rebarer and the Self-Reliant Initiative, which has been uh, strongly propounded, has, has been very much part of the Navy since the construction of our first indigenous, indigenously built ship, which is INS Ajay way back in the late 60s, uh, followed by the Nilgiri. And it's nice that the first big ship built was INS Nilgiri. And uh, there's no looking back after that. So we will also come, come up with the complexity of building nuclear submarines as well as the indigenous aircraft carrier, as well as let's talk about the LCA. So we are one of maybe three or four countries in the world capable of making a carrier-based fighter, which is a huge challenge. So LCA is a step in the right direction. I mean, notwithstanding certain areas which we are weak, say in uh, engines, so we have not been able to make an indigenous engine of our own. But otherwise, I think we are on uh, the right trajectory. And, and yeah. uh, looking at an uh, increasing number of our aircraft from 250 to over 400 in the next decade, as well as getting the best of ships and uh, weapon systems and sensors in the, in the years to come. So I think the Indian Navy is a good place to be. That sounds just about right. Yeah. I thank you very much, Admiral, for all your input this evening and for sharing so much with us, both on your personal side as well as your professional life. To our viewers, Admiral Pinamutu will be back with us towards the end of the evening. Uh, part two of the session is uh, about to start now in a few minutes. But before that, we have Johnny Paul from Vindia 1970, the president of the OLA, who will be sharing a few words with us. Welcome, Johnny. Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending the eighth session of the OL Nation. The OLA started hosting online events since May 2020 with the OL Assembly and then with two events every month since then. I would like to thank Kuntal Batch of 80, Rohan Batch of 86, and their teams, along with Karthik Batch of 84, and all the other committee members for the success of these activities. 
Your association is continuing to work on the oil marketplace on Facebook, where you may showcase your commercial activities and on the LSL Alumni Foundation, our charitable wing. We are looking forward to interested volunteers to help us in these activities, as well as in the redesigning and maintaining of our website. Hope you enjoy the session. Do look up our earlier sessions too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that, Johnny. Yes, yes, we've achieved a lot this year. A lot of water has flown and we have, I really sincerely hope, I'm so happy and I'm proud that I'm part of your team and part of our larger team with my colleagues and friends and that we've been able to share so much and give back a lot to our school. We've got a lot of stuff, you're right, we've got a lot of stuff lined up in 2021 as well. Like Kalpana mentioned earlier in the session, we also have the Big Hill broadcast. So thank you once more. Thank you once more for, for, for everything. Well, well, friends, thank you for being with us. Thank you for tuning in. We now have Samanthi Sinha Ray Devdar 1977. Samanthi was already introduced to you by Kalpana at the beginning of the session. She is in, at the start of the program. She is in conversation with Major General Anil Raj Singh Kalam, Vindhya 1983. Yes, Vindhya again. This promises to be a most interesting story too, and I'm really looking forward to his insights, especially since he is Chief Instructor Army at the, at the, at the DSSC, the Defense Services Staff College at Wellington. Thank you for being with us, Samanthi. Thank you for uh, your work so far, and welcome. Good evening, fellow Laurentians. Uh, I must say there are a whole lot of uh, advantages to being a Laurentian, but probably the biggest one is that you get to meet a host of interesting people and connect with them as family immediately, you know, right from the minute you see their faces and say, hey, I'm a Laurentian. So the last three days, I've had the wonderful uh, pleasure of spending time with a man who has been protecting our borders right from the frozen, barren uh, landscape of the Siachen Glacier to Jammu and Kashmir um, to the Northeast states as well. He has faced hostility, armed just with a national flag while keeping peace on the borders of Iraq and Kuwait as well. And today he sits in Wellington, very close to school, um, as the chief instructor for the army with the Defense Services Staff College. Ladies and gentlemen, Allow me to present Major General Anil Raj Singh Kelon, fellow Laurentian and Batch of 83. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for this wonderful honor of being able to be on screen with you all. Good evening. So, Anil, tell us, uh, you've been an army brat, right? And uh, what was it that pulled you back into the army? I mean, why did you, what were the, you knew all the pros and cons. So what made you choose the army as a career? Uh, I must confess that my uh, my father was a huge influence on me when I was growing up, and uh, he, he fortunately for us as his children, he had a fairly uh, varied kind of a life, uh, a very rich uh, career. He finally retired as a three-star general, but at the time, I would say when I was making up my mind, he had already taken us to Africa, where I had studied for a couple of years in Nigeria, he had taken us to Europe, and uh, he had taken time out to ensure that we developed a love for travel and in his own way he made sure that I understood the family values and the connect that you got when you join put on the olive green uniform. I suppose those things uh, it's very personal I must I must at this stage say like I mean somebody wants to be a photographer somebody wants to you know be a journalist I felt uh, and it happened in school frankly speaking I felt that I would be comfortable in uniform. It, I didn't join the NDA like uh, Vijay from my batch and all, but uh, I felt that uh, I could have. My mother, however, felt I should go into other lines like medicine. Uh, she motivated me to stick on for some time and uh, test the waters. But I made up my mind in college that I would definitely get to the services. That's how I went through the IMA. Uh, that was the main reason. The IMA, and call me old fashioned, call me a little uh, <laughs> romantic. But the uniform, uh, as worn by my father and what it symbolized, uh, meant a lot to me. 
and I thought it'd be good to put one on if I was worthy of it. Because not. So, um, there's one thing I've noticed. I got question. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, since you mentioned the uniform, um, there's one thing I've noticed about the uniform, and that is that uh, it doesn't matter where in the world you are, whether you're, you know, far away in the US of A or, uh, I don't know, Finland, Greenland, somewhere or the other. And but the minute you tell people that you're from the armed forces, they look at you in a different light. And uh, there is, especially if the other person's also from the army or the Air Force, maybe, um, there is again an instant bonding, which uh, do you agree with that? Oh, totally. I'm and uh, I've experienced it. I still remember we were sitting, I mean, sorry for a little bit of a story, but I still remember we were sitting in Orlando in SeaWorld with children. I wanted to show them uh, Shamu the Whale. I still remember that particular show which happens. And this cute girl who was the sort of presenter, she came on and said, before we start the show, we request all people from all of the world who have donned uniform to please stand up. So I was also with my children. They said, please stand up. So I also stood up and the whole audience applauded for us. And uh, after that, we uh, met up after the show. Those, those of us who had stood up and say, hey, you were in which corps, which, uh, and as a tank man, I could establish a connect with a uh, mechanized infantry officer and things like that. So I must say it's an international community and which I also experienced like when I went to the United Nations on the Iraq Kuwait border, uh, that uh, sense definitely prevails. It's an international community. Manji. Since you mentioned school, um, what do you think are the similarities between, say, life in LSL and life in the army? And uh, do you think LSL actually prepares you for a life in the armed forces? Very much so. Very much. In fact, uh, I would say the uh, there's a bit of a martial air about school, which, uh, and I must tell you, some of my course uh, my classmates used to pull my leg on this, particularly if I can take the name of Jesse Rachel Matthew. She came here home the other day. And she uh, took great joy in telling my wife that this idiot used to say these corridors speak to me when I used to walk through the you know school. And she says we've been there much longer than him, and we didn't find the corridors speaking to us. But somehow he he used to talk like that. Um, apart from that, you know the way we do our founders, the way we do uh, the way we used to put on battlers in those days, very very military, very very military. Uh, the punishments that the senior used to meet out to us, again fairly military, prepared us for the academy in a big way. Apart from that, I would say, yes, day-to-day uh, -day life, the challenges of PT, meals, games. Oh, yes, it's a wonderful primer for getting into the forces. Absolutely. What about the sense of family? You know, the, the sense that, uh, uh, which I felt um, as, I, I mean, like uh, Lovedale was my eighth, ninth school when I went in class eight. And but the kind of, you know, bonding and the sense of family and even after leaving Lovedale, um, again, like I said, it didn't matter who one was meeting, whether they were, you know, 10 years senior, 10 years junior. But the minute the word Lovedale came in, you were, you know, the same family. So do you feel that sense of family is what also connects the armed forces with school? I can draw a parallel between how we are with course mates. The same thing kind of applies over there. You go through training together, you go through some tough times together, and that's what creates the bond. School also, I, I must admit that, uh, see, I joined only in the 11th, as I mentioned in my little CV, which I sent across to you. Um, there were challenges in breaking into established bonds and uh, relationships, which already existed between uh, the classmates for several years. Hmm. But I think that it was a, a wonderful thing to be able to uh, join into the family. It took about five, six months. I, I, I seem to remember. Thereafter, it was uh, one, I mean, one made one's friends, which for life. And uh, I have seen that in the forces also, there are a large number of old Laurentians there. And whenever we meet up, uh, it's a special bond. There's always a little separate uh, special place for uh, for such people. Uh, we have attended get-togethers in Delhi and all, and uh, we find that people do uh, take time out for each other. So yes, absolutely. I've, I've got uh, uh, Laurentian friends who are 15 years younger than me, 20 years younger than me today in the armed forces. They'll walk up to me and say, sir, we are from the same school. Okay, it's wonderful. definitely something which continues. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. And uh, when you uh, got your own regiment, your own uh, armored corps division, um, Tell us a little bit about that. What what was it? Uh, you know, what was this sense of achievement, or what what did you learn from that? 
no actually in our time when we were joining the army the cavalry was uh, considered the elite arm of the uh, of and it, it's it's a little, a little interesting here the three of us from my batch who joined the forces is okay. Dheerat Seth, Vijay Singh, Rathor and me. All three of us became cavalry officers. So it was somehow, I don't know, ordained that uh, the three of us would uh, all join the cavalry. Uh, yes, uh, the cavalry poses certain technical and uh, other challenges, but it broadens your minds a little bit. I'm sorry for being a little uh, elitist over here. Some of the other uh, forgies from old Lawrence will not like it. But the fact is that the cavalry exposes us to a different level of, of, uh, of functioning and operating. It opened our minds a bit. And made us a little better students, I would say, of warfare. I don't know how interesting that would sound uh, compared to being a little uh, uh, within your walls. We were able to operate outside those domains with much senior levels. That held me in good stead in various appointments that I held over here. Now here, I mean, for the younger people who may be aspiring to join the forces, I would just like to say, uh, actually, it depends upon your aptitude. There is no arm which is uh, which cannot be uh, which can be done away with. So you could be an electrical engineer, you could be a, uh, you could be a helicopter pilot like uh, Pinamothal is, you could be a tank man like me or a foot soldier like Vikram, one batch senior to me, uh, batch of 82, uh, Pinamothal's classmate, Vikram Rathor from the Grenadiers. All of us have a huge role to play and there's tremendous satisfaction in discharging that particular function. I was fortunate to command my own unit. It's a, it's a bit of a clannish thing. Today my son is wearing the same uniform in the same unit. Uh, I was then fortunate to command an armored brigade. Uh, you got the, uh, the, you can see the elephant at the back. That's the symbol of that. Mm. And then later to command an armored division, which is the largest uh, mechanized formation that the Indian Army has. So it's, I've been very fortunate to have enjoyed these levels of command, which have done a lot for my uh, my development as a professional. I would say. Aji. And what about the the culture, the life? Uh, you know, uh, like. The extracurricular activities, apart from being a soldier, what else did you... And, oh, I'm so glad you asked that question because um, I think like when I was interacting with you earlier, I mentioned that I commanded my brigade in a place called Nabha in Punjab. And there's a very fine school called Punjab Public School, PPS, Nabha over there. And to my absolute surprise, when I used to be called across to speak to children, despite the fact they were children from Punjab, which has a very strong martial tradition, they were quite clueless about quality of life. They were quite clueless about the armed forces. Their impression was: you join the army, you put on, a, you wear a, you hold a rifle in your hand, and go stand at the border, staring at the horizon. That's not really true. You have field postings, but you have an amazing quality of life. I cannot understand how why the youth would not be attracted to a fairly good pay package, to a good quality lifestyle, to an officer-like conduct and treatment, where you are given your food in an officer's mess by waiters rather than running around in the streets as a salesman somewhere. I think uh, people should definitely look at this as a very high quality lifestyle. There are clubs, we have facilities which one would pay a fortune for outside. We enjoy them at a pittance. And uh, it's up to you now. I mean, the other thing is it's up to you. If you are going to make the most of your facilities and your time, there is no limit to what you can enjoy in the armed forces. So this is something that I would definitely like to state very categorically. That, uh, yes, it is up to us if we want to sit in front of the TV screen and watch Netflix all day. Well, that's up to us. But the facilities available are amazing and at, an, at a pittance. And uh, I think that they do a lot for your character development, family development, children, the kind of environment children get over here in the armed forces is absolutely amazing. That's, uh, that's my appeal or you can say my statement in no uncertain terms. And I think the forces also have a way of uh, making sure that the wives are equally active um, in the welfare of uh, the regiment, the camp, so to speak. Um, would you tell us a little bit about that? So tell me, is your wife there? I thought she was a cyclist. Why is she out running? Oh, she, she does it all. She, she does kickboxing, she cycles, she runs. She also works for a private company as, as a marketing developer. <laughs> she's she's wow. busy doing her own okay. thing. But coming to okay. the role that uh, I would say our ladies play in, in, the, in the armed forces, uh, I have always likened them to be the sweeteners in uh, in a in a dish. Uh, we are a little harsh in our uh, or strict, I would say, in our demeanor. Sometimes it's up to the lady to add the sweetening touch. She, while welfare, you know, there's a popular mis misconception. I would say that welfare, the ladies look into it. Not really. Welfare is a command responsibility. It is my responsibility as a superior officer to make sure that people under me are looked after. But yes, the lady provides an informal connect 
she gives you informal inputs and which are possibly more live and more uh, real and we are able to look into those aspects and the basic pillars of health and education uh, which possibly ladies are more geared up to get the correct inputs from uh, from the from the jawan's wives from the younger officers wives uh, so yes she serves as a tremendous foil to me uh, for improving the atmosphere i would say of whichever environment i am in as also getting me very real ground inputs uh, which i can then take action on so that is i would say the role that they play quite akin to i'm sorry for a little bit of uh, theology here but uh, we had uh, guru gobind singh from my religion the 10th guru and it is on record that when he was uh, uh, you know he was stirring the pot for the amrit for the khalsa his mother mata gujri she came and threw some sweets at patisa into the into the amrit so he asked her what are you doing so she said a sikh does not have to be only strong he has to be sweet also so i believe that the ladies add that element of sweetness to our lives over here in the armed forces absolutely wonderful so um anil tell me you've uh, held i mean going by what you sent us as your uh, bio, brief bio uh, you've held some really challenging positions and uh, the siachen glacier of course fascinates me because i always think of it as this pointy place where i don't know how you people sort of uh, survive tell us about it uh well there are some very pointy places let me let me put that uh, out there at, uh, right at the beginning uh, there are times when you are actually looking to your right and you're looking about uh, you know 7 8000 feet below but uh, it was an interesting one i actually um, went up there when people from the armored corps were not really going to the glacier it was primarily an infantry operation they asked for volunteers one was a little brash as a youngster so one kind of put one's hand up and uh, was promptly dispatched to do one's duty i functioned with the dogra battalion there which was a great uh, experience the glacier uh, apart from being the highest battlefield in the world where frankly uh, at that time at that time you if you saw something on the other side you shot uh, first and asked questions later but uh, i would say that it actually made you realize what mother nature is all about i mean uh, a simple function like breathing can be such a challenge you realize only when you are uh, living in a place like that you you can't sleep at night you 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 have wake up every half an hour 45 minutes because what happens is that you sleep your breathing rhythm slows down that leads to oxygen deficiency because as this oxygen is uh, very very uh, deficient over there so you wake up uh, pardon my dramatic but gasping <laughs> doing that every half an hour 45 minutes then you, you regain some kind of balance you, you sleep again appetite goes for a six you you lose colleagues uh, more to nature more to avalanches and falling into crevasses and things like that then to actually uh, enemy fire and uh, lastly before i finish this little thing i mean uh, the terrain is so bleak that you realize that possibly you get down to the essential of life uh, one now realize why the old time uh, monks used to go into these higher reaches to meditate and there is something magical about such places i mean you imagine standing outside reading a book by the moon uh, imagine going for a patrol and getting this eerie feeling that somebody is forcing your shoulder you on your shoulder to just drop to your knees and say a short prayer and the pressure remains there till uh, till, till you finish your prayer uh, those kind of things are actually uh, which add, those which add to the experience i would say you come away a very different person than when you went up there you value life much more and you respect mother nature much more and you you realize that your body can sustain far more than you give it credit for so i would say it's a coming of age experience going up to the glacier yeah that was a wonderful account anil um thanks thank you ma'am so you've also been in jammu and kashmir um i was in jammu and kashmir in kashmir actually srinagar in 91 and uh, <clears throat> uh, i had the fortune of meeting uh, somebody called colonel katoch who was heading the nsg at that time and uh, it was crazy the kind of life that they were leading so uh, you were right at the front in jnk i was uh, in jnk i was there on staff in a formation that was in a brigade that did a wide variety of tasks uh, we were supposed to do tasks across the border okay. we were supposed to do tasks this side of the border and we were also supposed to help out the civil administration it was a very challenging formation because uh, it was a reserve formation and therefore it had a wide variety of uh, roles to play out it was also the first element available to be launched in any kind of new development 
so that was a very challenging time but here my i could just add to you that uh, the kashmiris uh, are are a it's it's such a tragedy such a wonderful community with such a sense of uh, um, how shall i say what they call kashmiriyat uh, it was a different culture altogether very liberal uh, full of uh, uh, value for arts um, and very prosperous i mean uh, when i was there at least i didn't see a single homeless kashmiri uh, they all had sufficient means for a decent livelihood and uh, they were very how shall i put it very sweet people very decent people so we found at least we felt that uh, terrorism was apart from being uh, of course aided and abetted from across the border more of a cottage industry people were making money out of it and therefore to some extent uh, it was being fostered uh, i would say it was being allowed to continue i'm glad to say that today the, the situation is very different we have a, a very uh, very clear policy but uh, i still feel bad for kashmir uh, as as a, as a as a people they've lost out one generation has lost out just thanks to this foolishness i mean they are a great people it's a great state it's truly paradise uh, i thoroughly enjoyed interacting with the locals over there i thoroughly enjoyed eating a wazwan sitting on the ground with them and i must say that uh, i came away full of respect for them as a community i'm sure that uh, better times lie ahead for this uh, wonderful state of ours now of course you need territory <laughs> So, in the other uh, areas where you were doing counterinsurgency, um, apart from hunting out the bad guys, so to speak, um, there was a lot of other activities that you were doing, like building up the villages, schools, and things like that. Uh, how was oh, all yeah. that? Oh yes, I mean, uh, no insurgency can be solved militarily. It has to be done by a combination of development opportunities and making people realize that. Uh, Uh, terrorism is not the way forward so in our own humble way i won't say that uh, because i was in a brigade and that's a small formation so with whatever resources we could muster we made sure that in our area if a school was damaged because of floods or because of uh, an avalanche or something or a mudslide we used to set it right we would try and create conditions for children to be attending school regularly for teachers to come there otherwise teachers were not available uh, road infrastructure Uh, tracks to villages which were not connected which is something again which we could work on uh, we could work on uh, motivating some people to go for tours some bhavana tours to the rest of the country where they would realize that uh, india as a nation was progressing and it was in their interest to also uh, be part of this uh, story of progress uh, that's what we could manage of course at the higher level there are more sources and the army as as an organization does a huge lot in terms of sports nowadays there is coaching for competitive examinations so the children are being seen as those who have future and who are the future of this state so that's the target audience and that's that's working rather well i would say yeah so um being an army man it's not just about picking up your gun or pointing your tank and shooting it's also about uh, being a general manager and making sure that there's development and uh, all sorts of things dealing with people on the ground and uh, you know tying up the forces all together is that is that true oh yes i mean there that's what i said at the beginning i mean this impression that people have with the armed forces is just about you know wielding a weapon and going and and uh, staying in inhospitable areas no there is uh, there is there's an ecosystem around the armed forces and the and the armed forces looks after that ecosystem uh right down to our families which are in villages of the men right down to the people we are under who are under our direct command we give opportunities to our soldiers to study and uh, maybe become officers and some of them go out they leave the army and become i know of uh, soldiers who become professors so i mean uh, it's an ecosystem that one manages the the happiness quotient does be in short they work for self respect and they work for the flag and i dare say that the flag of the regiment maybe holds a shade of primacy in their collective uh, loyalties so you actually die for the guy next for next next to you you, you may not die for some uh, uh, for some just an ideal but you die for the person next to you so he's your buddy so uh, that feeling of uh, oneness in peace time when we are not actually in operations has to be fostered by sports by uh, engagements in the uh, in the intellectual domain 
by entertainment and by making sure that it, the quality of life uh, when a person is off parade, you know, there's a, we have a concept of on parade and off parade. On parade, we are serious. We train hard, we work hard, and then there's an off parade culture. I mean, if I may share an anecdote, when I was commanding my unit, we would have, uh, I would sometimes walk into my own house, and uh, I could hear voices coming from the dining room. Where the younger officers were telling my wife that, "Ma'am, why don't do something about this uh, about uh, our CEO? He's a he's a butcher." Uh, and then she would tell him, don't, don't worry, I mean, I can't do anything about him, but you eat omelets right now and get your energy back. And I'm telling them, look, guys, I can hear you complaining about, they say, good evening, sir. And they'll continue complaining. The next morning is another day, you get back to work. So uh, that's what I meant. It's a lifestyle. There's, uh, I know for a fact that if something was to happen to me today, my wife will be taken care of. And there'll be any number of friends and colleagues who will assist in all manner possible. That feeling of security, that feeling of being part of a larger uh, family, extended family, it, it, it's, it's very, very heartening. It's very heartening. Yeah. So when you mention flag, um, tell us about how you use the flag uh, to save your skin, so to speak, <laughs> when you were on the Iraq Kuwait border. That is so no, fascinating. No, no. Here I must give full credit to the legacy of India and it's, you know the legacy of Bharat uh, and Hindustan. If I use these names. Because I was in Iraq when I was a UN peacekeeper and uh, when you were on the Iraqi side, there was a demilitarized zone which extended deep into Iraq. Uh, on the Iraqi side, very often the civilians used to uh, misconstrue UN for US. You know, for them it was synonymous, um, which is not really so. And we were, we, we were mandated to patrol the demilitarized zone and make sure there were no incursions from, uh, from, the, from the allies. Well, there were some incursions, so there was uh, resentment that would brew up. And on a couple of occasions when one was on patrol, we would be, you know, surrounded by a mob with serious intent. I mean, carrying local weapons. Lynching was on the on, on the scene. And frankly, the only way to help that time is I used to have an Indian flag symbol emblem on my on my shoulder. If you got out of the vehicle, because if you sat inside the vehicle, you get lynched. So the only way to do manage is to get out. Stand in front of them, which slightly surprised them, and tell them that this is Hind. I am from Hind. And that, uh, frankly, saved me on two occasions at least, because India as a country had helped set up the railways and the universities. There were doctors in Iraq. Um, so that that legacy uh, and the symbol of, the, of, of India on my shoulder is what helped on a couple of occasions. Of course, we were unarmed. The only weapon we had was a UN flag on our uh, vehicle. But the emblem on the shoulder uh, did a lot, did a lot. Lifesaver, absolutely. Yeah. Wonderful. Good to know that India is so strong, especially in a country like Iraq. Wow. Um, I know a lot of uh, Air Force fighter pilots who went to Iraq as instructors. Absolutely. absolutely. Came back. There was a training team there. There was a training yeah. team there, to my memory. Absolutely. So Imagine. you've had, what, 34 years now running in the Army? I completed, I completed 34 years in December. Started my 35th year in uniform. Haji. And you are now here in Wellington, so close to school. I'm so jealous of you. Um, 18 kilometers. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Takes me 40 minutes and to get there. Tell the person I'm coming. He opens the gate, or the gate is shut. <laughs> yeah. So we have a question from uh, the audience, from the studio audience. They want to know if uh, the, the art of war, Rashid wants to know if the art of war by Sun Tzu plays any part in the training that is imparted to our younger generations in the well, army. Usually so, usually so. I know today Chinese is not a very good thing to uh, talk of, you know, with the, with the current uh, situation being what it is. But the precepts that Sun Tzu taught are current, are very live. However, very interestingly, and this is what I would like to leave with you all, and the Artha Shastra here, and the precepts there are amazingly relevant even today. So not just the art of war, we also teach, uh, I mean, Staff College luckily is a melting pot of all three services. So we have uh, Duhe, Mahan, so you got Air, uh, I mean, Air Force strategy, you got the Naval Maritime domain being taught, you got the land domain being taught, uh, maneuver warfare, etc. But yes, the question was specifically about Sun Tzu. As an intellectual, as a military historian, he enjoys great standing and therefore he is very much referred to. 
But we also referred to Maharaja Rajit Singh. We also referred to Kothelia. We also referred to Shivaji. And we referred to the wonderful maritime traditions of South India, which not many people uh, otherwise are aware of. So yes, it's it's Sun Tzu is one of the one of the uh, theorists who is referred to over here in our teaching. Yeah. And uh, another question we have, uh, this is from Captain Arjun Nair, is uh, tell us about, uh, you know, how, how does uh, the infantry and the various other divisions of the army, uh, how do they come together? Like you were with the Armored Corps, so did you have any uh, sort of, you know, uh, dealing with people from other segments of the army? Was there like a cooperation, a, a cohesive kind of... Uh, I don't know. Ma'am, uh, it's uh, nobody, like I said sometime earlier, can function alone in these services. So not only are you supposed to have an understanding about the arm, other arms and services, you have to function together. You train together. You do exercises together. So the infantry, the artillery, the armor, the engineers, the signals, it's actually one, uh, one wonderful mix. I mean, when I commanded my division, I had each such element under me. So it was my job to sort of tune the orchestra, if I may say so, which had armor in it, which had mechanized infantry, which had artillery, which had engineers, which had signals for communications, the works. And my colleagues who were commanding infantry divisions would uh, mesh together with me in the larger domain, in the larger exercises. There is joint training and joint exercising in any operation of war. In fact, if I may go a step further, there is a huge amount of joint interaction and joint training with the Air Force. and not maybe to that extent because the land domain is what we are primarily in but for amphibious operations etc there's a huge amount of interaction with the navy so we've got uh, naval divers up in uh, kashmir not only in pangongso but also in the wular lake you got uh, air force uh, commandos operating in various areas and we got army of officers embarking ships and going on uh, exposure uh, cruises or, or voyages for up to two two months so this cross-pollination of thought and, of course, with the CDS now very much being part of the government, the future indicates very clearly that joint theater commands and joint friendship, quite like it has happened in the U.S., is the order of the day. Uh, we have to do it ourselves, otherwise somebody will legislate it for us. So I guess the change is coming up from within, which is the best way for it to happen. Yeah. yeah, I remember uh, as an Air Force brat in Hyderabad, uh, Dundigal actually, the Air Force Academy, we had a lot of these handsome naval guys uh, who were training to be pilots. And I guess later on, probably Army, you know, helicopter flyers also came in and did training over there. But that wasn't happening during our time. Um, we have another question from the uh, audience, which is, uh, Will the future be fought remotely by drones rather than by direct combat? Uh, crystal ball gazing. Okay. Uh, the ages of warfare have been defined by technology. Uh, that is a reality. Uh, tactics have been adapted as per technology. So, I mean, if you had the first generation warfare, line and column, uh, everybody lined up, moved in, in order. Then you have the second generation warfare where firepower ensured that you had to get into trenches. Third generation of warfare, maneuver warfare, fourth generation asymmetric. And today, fifth generation warfare, the warfare of technology and perceptions. We just saw what happened in Azerbaijan and Armenia in the conflict. Drones had a very telling effect on both armor and artillery. Today, uh, the United, Air Force, United States Air Force uh, is uh, giving medals away to drone pilots for their excellent work done. I mean, the non-contact warfare in the cyber domain is is on as we speak. It's on as we speak. Artificial, inter artificial intelligence will be the new driver. It's a new oil. I mean, I'm sorry if I am taking a bit of a going on a bit of a tangent, but the fact is that if you thought the carrier battle groups which sailed to Taiwan last year of the U.S. were there in support of Taiwan, well, that is only one way of looking at it. They actually went there to make sure that the semiconductors, uh, those microchips, sorry, not semiconductors, microchips, those five nanometer, three nanometer microchips, which are made only in Taiwan and South Korea, are secured. And China doesn't get it, hold of it in order to uh, bring up its own artificial intelligence and such like capabilities. So technology is is a huge driver. I mean, data is a new oil. These are the, these are the realities that the armed forces have to adapt to. Here in the staff college, 
we are making an effort to evolve our own training curriculum as we speak because we no longer can consider the the warfare to be restricted only to the physical domain satellites artificial intelligence remotely piloted vehicles uh, drones this is these are realities i'm not saying that they will replace human beings not in the foreseeable future but they will have a telling effect on the tactical battle area as we call it and uh, we have to uh, adapt to it otherwise we will be left and what about retired officers do you think that uh, they can make more of a contribution to what is going on today or do you think that time has passed and uh, their wisdom is now something that has no relevance no simon i mean if, fact, say if general manik shaw were alive today um, how do you think he could he would be able to contribute uh there are a large number of retired officers who are working in think tanks they are working today in foundations like the vivekananda foundation the nalanda foundation uh there are officers who are teaching in universities and who are running schools so uh apart from of course uh, being in the business domain and in industry uh, i would say that when it comes to the armed forces the contribution of the uh, veterans is largely in the intellectual domain they contribute through think tanks they contribute with very frank and forthright views also a degree of specialization achieved by many of them which was not maybe possible when they were in service now when they retire they have time to uh, dwell on their aptitudes and their interests and come up as specialists in given areas and we 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 approach them for their views we uh, we have think tanks like claws that is center for land and air for air warfare studies we have uh, several other think tanks they are all members and they contribute in that domain their views are taken very seriously the study groups are our independent uh, inputs without any uh, fear or favor and uh, we have to take them very seriously so they are they are making a very telling difference even today we get a large number of speakers here at south college veterans of course uh, the currency of their knowledge has to be ensured because it also depends on the individual whether he is kept in touch and whether he has the interest to follow up uh, in in these fields so this has been a wonderful session talking to you anil and uh, i do hope i manage to come to wellington once before you go away how long are you going to be there for now no i am here for at least another year minimum and ah. all of you are welcome i am not very 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 visible on the social media and all uh, but anybody coming over here the house is open and you all are most welcome to come have meals with us stay with us whatever you feel like please okay. that will be my is, pleasure is that the army man talking or is that the sardar ji talking because <laughs> that's the laurentian talking how do you better be laurentian talking. 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 talking absolutely <laughs> absolutely okay. tell me something um, if you had to do this all over again would you i do have no doubt thing? that i would i have no doubt i would and in a way i'm sorry for again being a little philosophical maybe i'm already doing it with the the boys now in uniform um i am happy to say that i didn't uh, sort of force them i only showed them the good side in here my wife also has contributed immensely because um we only told them that look you decide for yourself but these are the positives these are the negatives and you decide for yourself so now that they both wearing uniform i'm kind of doing it again when i hear their stories when i see their, them going through their training challenges when i see them getting kicked around as young officers which is what they are supposed to do to learn the ropes it just takes me back through time and i i relive my years all over again because the fundamentals don't change the armed forces fundamentally don't change technology may be different thoughts may be different generation may be different the generation thinks very differently compared to what we used to think but yes uh, i am uh, doing it again already both the boys are in uniform and um, so if you had to say something to the young people at lawrence school lovedale today um, what would you say to them and vis-a-vis uh, -vis the armed forces and uh, one more part to the question which is uh, has our wonderful school motto of never give in has that played a role in has that helped you in any way in your career as an army man no no never give in is is, is so germane to uh, military thought it's not even funny i mean uh, uh, it's 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 just totally uh, in sync it resonates it resonates with military uh, and uh, so to that extent i mean i don't know whether this is a controversial statement on my part or not but uh, our actual school song sabse sundar jagse nayara vidya ka dhama mara 
दैट स्टैंड विच से इसका नाम अमर करेंगे इसकी शान बढ़ाएंगे बलबूदी में सर्वोत्तम हो वीर लॉरेंस कहराएंगे दैट इज ऑल्सो वेरी मिलिट्री लाइन and of course then we have the uh, the main schools are these other schools also never given so um, both of them both these lines in the two school in the two school songs english and hindi respectively i would say uh, resonate with the military approach to uh, situations and i would like to say to our my young brothers and sisters in school today uh, think of the armed forces as a high quality uh, uh, career and because you are at the next generation and you may not be looking at getting into the armed forces for life think of these year uh, you know these formative years as being something that put steel in your backbone and once that steel is there in your backbone you can take on any challenge any career any other option later in life and do well in it i am being very frank my two sons are wearing uniform today they may not wear it 10 years from now not like their father did for 34 years or 38 years but yes it put steel in your backbone to go through the training form the bonds understand what comradeship is understand what sacrificing your own interest for somebody else means these things i feel are good in any domain whether you are a doctor whether you are an industrialist whether you are a, i mean wherever you are heading a team these values will always remain so i would uh, i would strongly urge the younger generations to think of military training and a short if not long military career as a great foundation for a wonderful life and i'm willing to bet my salary that a large number of them if they join would like to stay on that's what i would like to say thank you so much anil for that wonderful pep talk i hope our young olorensians are listening the ones who've just left school and are headed towards college it's always good to have some sort of uh, direction given by people who are in the profession um as to uh, you know what they can look forward to when they get it to it themselves and i'm sure everything that you've spoken about over here the excitement the travel the life the culture the uh, you know the camaraderie and everything is has given them a clearer view of what the army is all about and uh, hey lorentians are you listening go go join the army save our country okay and uh, thank you so much for being such a strong speaker tonight Anil and for answering all my questions and the audience's questions uh, we look forward to maybe seeing you again soon sometime thanks thank you ma'am thank you and i would like to place on record my gratitude to all the all of you i mean for me it's been experience and experience to get into a webinar of this nature thank you all thank you rohan thank you for for the text uh, for the advice and for putting me on to this show um, ma'am your questions were absolutely incisive and uh, i'm glad i got an opportunity to uh address larger issues i'm sorry if i've rambled a bit but we are in the army are also great storytellers and uh, thanks to everybody uh, arjun sir for motivating me from uh, chennai and all thank you all it's been a wonderful experience and i look forward to meeting you all in person whenever we can at the earliest opportunity thank you very much hi philippos welcome back and uh, good to see that you're in your series now So well, great, great to be back in a more uh, casual kind of mood. So tell me something, uh, since you are dressed casually, um, there's been this whole last year of COVID uh, that's been happening, and uh, have you guys been sort of actively doing things uh, with civilians, with people around you, the villagers and stuff around you, to help the government initiatives? Yeah, very much. Yep. Yeah. Uh, very much. I mean, in the sense, uh, ever since COVID uh, hit us early in this uh, in the last year, we uh, kicked in to help out the uh, local populace as well as the veteran community. So, Goa Naval Area has a total of about seven thousand servicemen, if you include their families, as well as a civilian workforce. So, the immediate problem was to ensure that. the basic provisions are uh, sent to all these uh, families so we started with uh, like marshaling all whatever resources we had uh, with us I mean, in our store houses as well as our canteens and things so after we met this requirement i felt it's only right that we reach out to the veterans so we had these prepackaged uh, uh, packs which we sent to all the veterans around here which is a sizable number of enlisted as well as uh, the officer community including two ex chiefs of naval staff 
and uh, so that went uh, went about uh, in a really efficient manner and uh, though my guys were a bit nervous about the possibility of replenishments not coming and uh, finally one had to keep a fighting force going so i mean if we were very generous with sending out whatever we had and if replenishments didn't and come up it would have been, been an absolutely marvelous session uh, it was so wonderful chatting with you um, i felt i was back to being a soda again senior officers daughters association and uh, but uh, philippos i've known of course since uh, he was also an air force brat and uh, wonderful family his sister was one of my best buddies and uh, simon his brother of course we all love very much and miss the fact that he is not here today and uh, anil thank you so much for spending so much time with us i had promised myself that i would call you general and call philippos admiral mm -hmm. but uh i don't know somewhere it got to me that i was a senior and i can call you anil and pippo so bye guys i hope you all had a wonderful time and uh, my hair still standing on end listening to some of these stories and i'm sure yours is too so jai hind as nitaji thank you ma'am thank you jai hind jai hind thank you thanks thanks so much uh, really great being here can i uh, make a kind of a party shot at my friend anil <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so for the, I mean, since this is a recruitment drive, all the young guys out there, I mean, I can, you can take your call. I mean, if you wear a, if you want to wear a suit with a really fancy tie and all that, you can join the army. You want to wear a pink shirt, t-shirt with a round neck. <laughs> <laughs> I have a hard job. Maybe it's pretty serious. Okay. <laughs> and of course, girls, 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 girls. If you want to fly, no. soar across the sky, join the air force. <laughs> Ma'am, I've got one son in the uh, army, one okay. in the navy, and that's why I'm I'm a little scared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got a son in the navy. I'm married to a yeah, naval officer. Yeah, daughter. I must. Uh, yeah. So we are looking for a daughter-in-law from the air force. No, and there is a air force officer. She great, has great. to be an officer. Absolutely, absolutely. Flyer. Absolutely. Wow. absolutely. So, so Anil's son is uh, training to be a naval aviator. We're really proud to have him with us. And, uh, Thank you, sir. Uh, very soon, he's going to be like. Uh, Bring the sound barrier and fancy fighter. So I wish him all the all the very best. Thank you. Thank you. Well, folks, there you have it. It was a long, intense, and cut. Well, folks, there you have it. We are now at the end of our program. I want to thank you for being with us again once more. We are looking forward, obviously, to OL Nation. Nine, which is going to be towards the end of Feb. More details are to follow. More importantly, let us let us now once again thank our two distinguished guests, Semanti as well and Kalpana, and so many of the OL Nation team behind the scenes: Captain Arjun Nair, Rashid Kapadia, Murad Lala, Atul Veer, Nikhil Bojwani, and others who, who work together with me to ensure that we can deliver to you something of value. Thank you, gentlemen, and have a good evening. Now you have been watching this, you have been watching this program, these several of several of you have been watching these programs now over the last nine or ten months. It takes a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of contribution from so many people out there. And as always, uh, you know we, we do get a lot of uh, comments, uh, calls on, uh, on 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 our phones, WhatsApp messages. We still are looking for. Do um, you have any ideas? Let us know. Would you like to contribute? Some, many many folks call me and ask me, "What can we do to help?" Well, it depends on how much time you have, and obviously your skill set and your intentions and what message you want to convey. You could recommend people. You could talk about something yourself. Uh, you could contribute in with uh, with tech, with technology, with social media management, uh, and uh, I, I hope to share some stories from young old, young old Laurentians who've been in touch with us and we ourselves as our team we've been you know connecting connect, connecting folks with uh, with our others in, in, in terms of mentorship in terms of internships and just general advice we're here to give we're here to share please don't be shy please get in touch with us you can drop us a line on contact at ol-nation.com or the OLA gmail which is olalovedale at gmail.com.
www.sbsenglish.com. We look forward to hearing from you.